So, hi, hello, everyone. I welcome you to this um, keynote or workshop using uh, images effectively in language teaching. And we have the honor of meeting Joe, <laughs> but you will help me with your name, Joe. Sure, my last name is McVeigh. McVeigh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, he is an, uh, he, uh, he wrote that his he did his first webinar in a virtual round table <laughs> in 2012. And uh, now, nine years later, he uh, is at least once again here, maybe <laughs> he has been here for several times. He works independently uh, offering professional development program review and consultant services to English language programs. He is from the US and has given workshops in the US, but also around the world. He has taught uh, uh, a lot of uh, persons in uh, the uh, US Department of States, but also at uh, universities for teachers, for TESOL. And he is uh, uh, the author of two books, Skills for Success, a series from Oxford Press University and he's co-author of Tips for Teaching Culture from Pearson's. So uh, I say the floor is yours and I'm going to sit a uh, step back and enjoy your presentation. Well, thank you so much for that kind, um, for that kind introduction. I'm uh, very happy to be with you all here today and uh, to talk about using images in language teaching. And, you know, I'll tell you, the, uh, the people in the room here has, has turned over a bit during the day. And so I thought we might start off by just asking people where you're from. And my original thought had been to have you uh, put a dot on the map using annotations. But after Marissa's recent experience, if you would just take a minute and type, uh, type in the chat, you know, where you're from and maybe what time of day it is there, and we can get a better sense of, of who, is, who is here with us uh, now. So just take, take a minute to do that, if you wouldn't mind, um, telling us where you are and what time it is. So Marissa, of course, is in Athens. Where it's in, and Angelica's in Austria. It's about seven in the evening. So don't be shy, you guys. This there's this is this is some group participation here. So take a minute and, and just in the chat, jot jot down where you are and what and what time it is there. Brussels is says says Heike. Well, I'll let the rest of you get caught up there. Um uh, in, in the chat, I am from um, Vermont, which is in the northeastern part of the uh, United States. It's a small state. And uh, if you if you look at us a little bit closer on the map, you'll find that uh, the, the closest major metropolitan area to where I live is, in fact, in Canada, in uh, in Montreal. If you know anything uh, about Vermont, we're famous for a few different things. Um, one of those things that we're famous for is maple syrup. We make a lot of maple syrup for pancakes. Uh, another is Ben and Jerry's ice cream. We, we, um, the originator of, of Ben and Jerry's here in Vermont, it's our largest tourist attraction. But recently we're probably most famous for our Senator, uh, Bernie Sanders, who has, has become really quite, uh, quite well known. So I wanted to give you a little sense of the place where I am because our talk today is about using images in language teaching. And one of the things that we can use images for is kind of transporting people to a new place and giving them a sense of what it's like there. So here in Vermont, uh, in the winter time, it's very cold. Uh, this is a ski area quite close to, to where I live right now. It's the springtime and the leaves are starting to come out. It's a beautiful, light green color. It's it's raining today. It's going to be pretty hot here in the summer, 
lot of people like to come here in the summertime to uh, to hike and to boat uh, and so on. And we also get quite a lot of tourists in the fall because the leaves change color here and uh, it's, it's very, very beautiful. Uh, and then in the winter, we kind of start all, uh, all over again. So that's uh, just a little bit about uh, Vermont and the, the place where I am and a sense in which we can use pictures uh, to convey uh, a, a location or an idea uh, to, to people. And if, if you're interested in this place, I'll just stick in the chat here uh, a link to uh, an interview that took place earlier this week that has more pictures of, uh, of Vermont and more about me and in Vermont. Well, today uh, we're really hoping to do three things. Um, share some activities for using images in the classroom, uh, looking at some good sources for obtaining free photos, and then considering some fairly basic techniques for taking photos and for making use of digital images. So I'm, I'm gonna start us off with something that I think a lot of you may remember from your childhood. Now here in the US, we have a, a custom, I think it's considered bizarre in, in other parts of the world, but we often, um, oh, is, is that right, Heike? The chat has been disabled. Well, that would under, explain why we didn't get very many responses there. Um, um, only the co-hosts were able to chat. I was just, uh, Joe Dale just pointed it out to me. Now everybody should be able to chat again. Sorry, it was the grief. Uh, Earlier, so. Oh, I'm so glad. I was I, I was concerned that that we weren't getting much in the in the way of uh, group participation. So um, thanks for uh, re-enabling the chat. And if you wanted to type in where you're from, where you're watching from, that would be great. Great, Estela from Argentina, Andrea from Hungary, from China, Italy, Iran. Wow, that's great. Thanks, everybody. I feel so much better now that I'm seeing uh, people uh, people chiming in. Well, here in the US, we have a, a, a custom that some people think is a little bit bizarre, and that is for breakfast, we, we often get a box of, of cereal and we put it in a bowl and we put milk in it and we, uh, we, eat, it with a, um, we eat it with a spoon. And uh, often to, to keep the children entertained on the back of the box, there'll be some activity. And I've brought an image of that activity to, to test your, uh, your knowledge here. So this is a, a hidden, picture activity. And if you look in, the, uh, in this picture, what objects can you see hidden in the picture? Just go ahead and type those in the chat box uh, if, you can, if, you can see, uh, if you can see any, any items that are, might be hidden in this uh, picture. Okay, Fabrizio says umbrella, Marissa, tennis ball, Angelica, book, bike, treehouse. Yeah, I think the bike and the treehouse aren't really hidden. So, so we're looking for items that are kind of concealed in there. Tennis racket, a kite. I'll, I'll make it a little bit easier for you. I will give you a list of poss some possible items that you, might, that you might find in this picture. That might make it a little bit easier to find uh, some of these things. Now, something I could do with students in the classroom, of course, would be to take these items and to use it uh, to practice prepositions of place. So I could say, well, it's fine for you to tell me that there's a, there's a sun or a kite or a football, but where is it? Where is it located? What is it? Is it in front of something? Is it behind something? Is it next to something? Is it on top of something? Uh, and so on and so on. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll um, show you some of the answers of, of what some of those things are. The, the, uh, there's a shoe on the roof. There's a baseball bat below that roof. There's an umbrella in the tree. On the far right, you can see a, a magnifying glass or maybe a, uh, uh, some people think that's a, a tennis racket. Down below at the bottom, there's a ball, there's a book and, and hidden in the uh, front wheel of the bicycle is a, uh, a beach ball. And lots of people saw the kite uh, up, in the, uh, up in the tree. So really one of those things that you may remember from your youth from a magazine, but it, it's, it's kind of fun because you look at it and at first you think you see everything, but then when you get the list, you don't. And I can tell you, I think there are about a dozen things in this picture. And I got the first 10 and I could not for the life of me find the, the, the last two. So it's, it's one of those activities that can work on different levels. You know, it's partly easy, it's partly a little bit more 
more, uh, more challenging. Well, our talk today is about images and uh, I'm, I'm gonna date myself with my white hair by telling you that my very first uh, presentation that I ever gave at an English language conference was in 1984. And it was on uh, using this device, which some of you will recall is the slide projector. Now, of course, we're always interested in cutting edge technology and what is new and what is interesting and how it can be used. But I want you to know that back at that time, the slide projector was a sufficiently uh, important device for audiovisual purposes. It had its own book on using slides in, um, in language teaching. Of course, there were lots of technical challenges uh, to using slides. You had to put them one, one uh, type of slide projector required you to put the slides in order in a carousel upside down and backwards uh, that you would then use to project and, and they would sometimes jam and they would sometimes fall out. We used to have to try to organize them by putting them on a rack kind of like this and you could put the try to put them in the right in the right order. I, I probably have thousands of these still left over from 35 millimeter slides that are all all over the place. But you know, one of the first rules of, of educational technology is you wanna test everything out before you use it with the students. And one of the first courses that I ever, um, that I, Chris is, is remembering slide projectors back in the old days. Um, one of the first uh, times that I tried to give a little teacher training class on how to use the slide projector, I went into the room and I had a technical malfunction. And you can try to imagine what the problem was with the slide projector. There, there were a, a few different things that could have gone wrong. Um, the bulb could have burned out, but that didn't happen. Um, it, I could have forgotten to bring an extension cord so that I couldn't get it into the right place, but that didn't happen. There could have been a problem with the screen, but no. The, the problem was it was it turned out to be impossible to darken the room. It was a room that had those ancient um, Venetian blinds in them that, that open and, and close and you couldn't close them. You couldn't darken the room. And so my whole lesson on, uh, on using slides was a bit of a disaster that, that first go round, but I learned and I haven't made that mistake uh, again. I've made different mistakes in, instead. So I wanted to, to look at a, um, an activity that we might use that would involve images, but this really uses very little in the way of technology. And uh, it, it's a activity dealing with pronunciation. And it's something you can do with Blackboard drawing, or perhaps if you're using a uh, Zoom or uh, Jamboard or something similar, it could be whiteboard drawing because you could draw on the whiteboard. And for this, I'm drawing, drawing on an oldie but goodie, an, an old, old book by Andrew Wright. And you might know Andrew Wright more, these days he's probably better known for storytelling, but he wrote several books about using images in the classroom. And in his book on a thousand pictures for teachers to copy, part of what he was trying to get across to people was that anybody can draw. You need not have any spe special artistic talent. And he showed you how easily you could just draw pictures of people or you could draw the weather. And it, it wasn't difficult uh, at all uh, to do that. And so I learned through um, trial and error, that you could draw almost anything on a whiteboard and label it and the students would believe you, right? It didn't actually have to be realistic. Uh, you could draw a stick figure of a person and say, this is a person and they will believe you. You could draw a, a circle with another circle on it and say, you know, this is a dog, or you could say, this is a cat, or you could say, this is a pig. And, and as the students will will retain that idea and then you can use it for different purposes. So here's one of my very simple blackboard drawing examples. Uh, can you tell me what this is? See if you could type your answer in the, in the, in the chat. What do you think? Okay, Andre is saying lamb. Okay, lamb, sheep says many sheep, sheep, sheep. Okay, I, I had, um, I, th I thought it was a sheep. All right, here's my, here's my next blackboard drawing. What, what do you think this might be? Boat, boat, you, boat, sail ship, sailing boat, boat, good. You know, it's it's actually what I had in mind, it's it's probably a bit 
a shoe it could be a, could be a shoe i suppose yeah but but after i tell you what it is then you'll know because what what this really is is it's a ship so now i have a sheep and i have a ship and i have an easy tool to do a, a minimal pairs pronunciation activity right I, is it a sheep is it a ship i can uh, point to it and have students say it. I can say it and then have students point to it to indicate what they're what they're hearing. I can use it as a prompt to get them to do pronunciation. So this is something I can do quite easily with Blackboard drawing. Very, I can number them too. Is did you hear number one? Did you hear number two? Did you hear number one? Did you hear number two? So I can easily do this with simple, simple Blackboard drawing or. I can do this with images. So here's a slightly more sophisticated version because at the top left, I have my sheep. At the top right, I have my ship, right? So there's my e, e distinction, right? But now look down below, I have the word cheap. And then uh, in American English, I have the word chip. Of course, in British English, uh, you're gonna call these crisps. So that's gonna cause problems. But in American English, I have cheap and chip. So now if I go, from the top left to the bottom left, I have sheep and cheap. I have the sh, ch sound. On the right hand side, if I go from the top to the bottom, I have ship and chip. So again, the sh, ch sound. Uh, and then going back and forth, I have e, i, right? Cheap, chip, sheep, ship. So this is something that I can use in the, in the classroom. So the question that I have for you at this point is, what are some different ways that you make use of images in uh, in your teaching. How do you use images in the classroom? What kinds of images do you use? And what would be an example of a way in which you might make uh, make use of them? Just just give us a, in, a, in a couple of two or three words, you know, something that you might do with, with images. Of course, you know, in a, a conference like the one that we're at uh, over these past few days, the, the whole concept of images is, is fairly simple, isn't it? Uh, the whole idea of pictures, but I still think that there are a few things that, um, that we might be able to, um, to learn and use together. Hide and reveal, says Sharon. You might hide something and then show it. Fabrizio said, you know, say what's happening, describe what's going on in this picture. Um, Andre uses images as a warm up to, to, um, to introduce the topic. Those are some really good ideas using his metaphors for discussion. Okay, great, great. Describing feelings, pictograms to introduce activities, says Jana. Nice, nice. Uh, oh, create a dialogue between two people, right? Here are these two people. What are, what are they saying to each other? That's great. That's great. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you introducing new vocabulary. Yes, very, very good. Uh, I'm going to show you an, an activity that uh, I think you, you'll, you'll enjoy. This is a, an activity um, relating to idioms. I'm going to show you some pictures, and the pictures are going to represent idioms in, in a rather explicit way. See if you can figure out what the idiom is and, and type it in the, uh, in the chat. So here is the first example of an idiom. What idiom in English is being represented here? Okay, to let the cat out of the bag, to let the cat out of the bag, right? Which, which means to um, reveal some information that maybe should have, been, uh, should have been secret, okay? How about this one? Uh, Get, yeah, okay, so I, I would use for this one, to, you know, to, to, my, to, to get your ducks in a row, to put your ducks in order. Uh, yeah, I'd say get, get your ducks in a row, meaning um, to, to get yourself organized, to get everything ready, to, to make sure that everything is, is ready to go. Um, how about this one? We have a watch and we have a small animal. The animal is a snail, if you can make it out there. So probably to move at a snail's pace, right? Which would be snails move very slowly. So to move at a snail's pace is, is to move quite, uh, quite slowly. Okay, here's the one I think Chris was looking for earlier. 
<laughs> is this hard, Odette? I'm sorry. I should I should include have included an, an answer key. Um, so birds of a feather, and what do birds of a feather do? Yeah, I would say birds, birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> Send this together. <laughs> Stick together. Yeah, so birds of a feather flock together, meaning that uh, people who are similar to each other enjoy each other's company, right? People who are the same like to, to hang out with, e with each other. Um, here is a dog on the beach sleeping. What idiom would it represent? Okay. Oh, it's a dog's life, says Sharon. Yeah, I was thinking what Helen said, let sleeping dogs lie let sleeping dogs lie meaning uh don't don't yeah l-i-e yeah l-i-e let sleeping dogs lie meaning don't disturb something which is doesn't need to be disturbed just just leave it alone leave it alone So this is a fly on the wall. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be a fly on the wall or to wish that you were a fly on the wall? You know, it means that you wish that you could be in a room and listen to the conversation and hear what's going on, but probably you're not able to, uh, to do that. This one I found a little bit tricky, but think about what is the object on the table and what is being done to that, to that object. Yeah, Joe, Joe's got it. Breaking, breaking the ice, right? To break the ice, to, to, well, crush the ice, yeah. But the idiom, the idiom would probably be to break the ice, meaning to uh, start something, especially to start a conversation or to, to warm up a, a group of people. Okay, a few more. Um, this, is, uh, this is fairly literal. What, what is this hand doing to this object, would you say? What is the object? The object is hay. The hay is being hit. And to hit the hay means to, uh, to go to sleep, right? To go to bed. Ooh, looking for a needle in a haystack, says Sharon. This one might be interpreted a couple of different ways. Um, but I thought that this one uh, kind of looked like the light at the end of the tunnel, meaning the, um, a positive outcome uh, that we'll get to sooner or later. This, I think, is self-explanatory. It's cheating a little bit with the um, the activity, isn't it? Not my cup of tea, meaning that's not something that I really like. That's right, Georgia. Yeah, you got that. Um, here again, we're cheating a little bit by including some text. Um, and the answer is on cloud nine, which means to be very, very happy, right? If you're on cloud nine. Here is a picture from our very own Carol Rainbow. Um, and can you tell what is what is happening here? Something is going from one place to another, from the frying pan or out of the frying pan, yeah, into the fire, meaning going from a bad situation to an even worse situation. That's, that's too bad. Okay, a couple more. Um, you might use a different vocabulary word for this uh, item, depending on what part of the world you, you live in. Um, where I live, I would call it a cookie. So that's how the cookie crumbles. That is the way the cookie crumbles. That's the way things happen, happen sometime. Here's a contribution uh, from Scott Thornbury, who, who suggested this photo of a bowl of cherries. And there's an idiom, life is just a bowl of cherries that we use sometime. Um, here's one I think you might be able to get. What are these people doing? Yeah, dip, dip your toes in the water, maybe. Um, I think we might use the expression to get your feet wet, to get your feet wet, meaning to, to start to start doing something. How about, let's see, well, this is, um, this would be a glass ceiling representing the difficulty of getting up to the next level, especially based on your gender or your social uh, position. Two peas in a pod would be uh, two um, 
two things or individuals that are quite quite similar. And then here, this last one, I think uh, is is open to interpretation a little bit. Um, but I would use this as the idiom of of two people meeting unexpectedly and having a conversation. I think we might say to bump into somebody, right? You you bump into them, um, and and so on. Now I think we could make an argument that these pictures are not that helpful because what are they? They're really the literal interpretation of the idiom. And the idiom is figurative speak, figuratively speaking. And this is like the literal interpretation. It's fun, right? But we might wanna be a little bit careful. But where could you find all of these incredible pictures of idioms that would be free that you could very easily um, that you could very easily use. And the answer is you could find these in a location called ELT Picks. And uh, EL, for ELT Picks, we largely have to thank uh, Marissa Constantinides, who is the, one of the founders of a Twitter group called ELT Chat, which for many years uh, met uh, very regularly and people would uh, get together and, uh, and talk uh, to each other about issues related to English language teaching back before we had all these platforms when we could literally uh, talk to each other. And a group of teachers uh, who were part of the ELT chat on Twitter got together and uh, put together this amazing collection of images to use for language teaching. Well, what's one of the big problems of getting images for well, okay, Marissa is only responsible for ELT chat, but ELT picks came from ELT chat. So you're 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 the the grand the grandmother or the the godmother. Um, one of the big problems of finding images is finding images which uh, are not copyrighted, which are permitted to be uh, to be used. And um, what these teachers did was they said, hey let's pool our resources because the best pictures are the ones that we take ourselves, right? Because those don't have those rights. And so what they did was to say this week, okay, everybody send in pictures of food or this week, everyone send in pictures of vehicles or this week, everyone send in pictures of nouns. And gradually over the course of time, they built up a corpus of 25,000 pictures, um, which are all, um, which are all sorted according to uh, to, to to topic. And uh, thanks very much. Uh, somebody put the uh, the link in the in the chat there a little bit earlier. That was Sharon. Uh, www.eltpix.com. Now, if you were to go to this website, um, what you would find is all of these pictures organized according to different categories. And so here, for example, you can see categories for tools, relationships, binomial expressions, containers, abstract nouns, adjectives, animals, appearance, art and craft, and barriers. Well, we're near the, the beginning of the alphabet here, right, with adjectives, animals, appearance, arts and crafts, uh, and so on. And there are thousands and thousands of, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say thousands. There are many, many, many categories of pictures. So you might think if you were gonna collect pictures and organize them, what sort of categories might you use and want to put them in? Now, when I was first uh, starting out in English language teaching, one of the things that I was required to do as part of my materials course was to put together something that we called the magazine picture file, in which you would go and cut pictures out of magazines and uh, put paste them on some harder, larger kind of paper and categorize them according to food or, or um, uh, you know, verbs or um, some, something like that. And, and, and then you'd carry it around with you for class and you could pull it, pull it out and you had pictures that you could put on the board and little pictures that people could trade back and forth. So ELT Picks is, is like the, the magazine picture file of the, digital, of the digital age. So here's an example of one of the categories uh, of pictures. These pictures are all part of the same category. What do you think it is? What do you think this category is supposed to illustrate? You can see a picture of someone eating a sandwich or a bagel. You can see a cup of tea. You can see someone driving. You can see a mop and a, a bucket, uh, maybe a bakery. What, what do all these pictures have in common? What are they all part of? What category would they fall into? 
And I think that the answer to this one is, is everyday, everyday life, you know, things that somebody might do every day if you were trying to, um, if you were trying to uh, put together a unit on that subject. Yeah, day-to-day -day activity, as, as Heike says. So question, if you find an image on the internet, you can download it and use it for free. Is this true or false? Well, <laughs> yeah, I see false, I see no way, I see it depends. Hmm, false, 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 false. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about this. If you, uh, for example, go to uh, Flickr or, or Google, uh, what you really want, <laughs> false, but everybody does it, says Charles. Yeah, well, they do that with songs too. So that's, that's the thing. So if you were to go to Flickr, uh, you, what you're really looking for is an example of a, an image that has a Creative Commons license. Okay, so in a Creative Commons uh, actually has six different levels of, um, of permission. Uh, I've, I've simplified it to three, but the easiest one is it says, okay, you can use this picture, but you have to link back to the person who made it. In other words, you have to have a clear attribution to the person who came up with this picture. Uh, one could also say, uh, here's a picture and you have to link back to the person who, who made it, but you can change it if you want to, you can modify it. Well, now what if I have a picture, but I wanna crop it. I wanna change the, the size of it a little bit. That's a modification, isn't it? What if I have a picture, but I wanna put text on top of it? That's a modification, isn't it? So I wanna have permission for modification. The other uh, level of permission is for commercial use. Some photographers will say, well, I'm happy for you to use this, but you can't use it for anything in which you might be making money. We, I don't want you to be making money uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of way. Well, I'm a teacher, I'm not likely to be making money, but wait a minute, what if I give a conference talk and what if I get an honorarium for that conference talk? Or I do something for a publisher and they pay me to do it. Is that commercial? Well, it, it, it might be. So what I try to do, when I am looking for images is to look for uh, images that have the most generous terms of use. So if I were to go to Flickr and look for items under a Creative Commons, I would really be looking for the most generous terms of the Creative Commons, which are commercial use and modifications allowed. Um, you, you, you can't always get that, but, but sometimes, sometimes you can. So, of course, these days, a lot of people go and find their pictures on Google. Well, if you're gonna look for pictures on Google, you're probably gonna wanna make sure that they're the right size. You're gonna wanna check the usage rights. But the problem on Google is a lot of times people say <laughs> that you have permission to use it, but you really, you really don't. I, I, don't, I don't trust Google very much in that regard. But you do wanna document the photographer and, and the origin because you want to be able to attribute the picture to the photographer, right? So why do we want to be able to do that? Why do we want to be able to say who took this picture? Well, there are a number of different reasons that we might want to do this. Uh, we want to be legal, right? We, we wouldn't want to get sued down the road. Um, we want to respect the work and therefore the intellectual property rights of the people who created it. Um, we may want to be able to find this image again later if we need to, and it's going to be easier if we've attributed it to the, the photographer. Um, it's the right thing to do, and also it sets a good example for our students and for our colleagues. Now, there's a very proper way of giving attribution, and if you go to the ELT PICS site, it will tell you exactly what you should do. And if you go to the um, Creative Commons site, they will also tell you exactly how you should go about uh, attributing different things for, for them. And I'll put the, that uh, link here in the, uh, in the chat. Um, here's an example. If I, if I do a webinar for the US Department of State, can you read the fine print here at the bottom of this slide? 
It says copyright 2019 by Joe McVeigh. Here's the title, Implementing Content-Based Language Instruction in Your Classroom for the Office of English Language Programs. This work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license, except where noted to view a copy of this license, visit, and then here's the link. Whew, boy, that's a lot, isn't it, to, to, to do that uh, properly. And, and here's the same thing from a different talk that I did for them as well. It's almost uh, identical, except that, that we've changed the, the date and the, and the name. And then for, because these guys really want to stick to the letter of the law, if I used uh, an image like this, I don't know if you can see exactly what's at the bottom of this image, but it says image colon, and then the title of the image, Bodies in Motion, which is in fact a link directly to that image by Paul Stevenson, licensed under, and then the link to the Creative Commons license. And that's absolutely the way that you're supposed to do it uh, by the book. I don't usually do that because it's a lot of work. And because if, if these links are gonna work, these links can't be part of the image. They have to be part of my presentation because they have to be clickable, right? So what I usually do is I, I try to give a credit by saying, where did I get this from? It came from Flickr. Who took the picture? It was the person whose username is Bark. And I'm thinking this should be enough to get the person to uh, from one place uh, to, to another if they really want to find this image. So let's take a look at, at obtaining photos online. Here's some different steps in obtaining photos online. First of all, you're gonna find a particular photo sharing site or you're gonna search online and we'll look a little bit later at some different sites. You're gonna choose your photo. You wanna check for usage rights and who the creator is. Use, choose the appropriate size of the image. And then when you save it, you wanna use a helpful file name. And then you wanna store it in a place where you can find it. So we're going to try this now uh, at a, and we're going to go to a site called Pixabay, uh, which is one of these photo sharing sites that you can easily, um, you easily get to. So let me, um, let me take us to Pixabay if I can. So here's a, a picture of, uh, of Pixabay. And uh, I think, yeah, I think I might already be logged in here. You, you need an account here, it's free, but you, you do need it to, to log in. So I'm gonna search, say, for a picture of a teacher. And I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the search bar and I'll click return. And it's gonna return a whole bunch of pictures. Well, some of these are clip art and I don't really necessarily want clip art. So if I go up here to the top, I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, I'm gonna click on photos so that I have photos rather than um, all those other things. Uh, and then I'm gonna, uh, I, if I want to, I can refine my search according to the orientation of the picture. Is it you know, landscape or portrait? Uh, how big is it? Does it have certain colors in it and so on? So I'll go down here and I'll look for a picture of a teacher that I like. I'll say, okay, well, let's, let's take this picture of a teacher. I'll click on the picture and it will uh, give me a larger version of it. And it'll tell me a few different things. At the top here, you can see, here's the name of the photographer, Jerry Kimball 10. Now I want this information because I wanna be able to attribute it to him later. So I'm actually gonna write that down separately. Okay, Jerry. Kimball 10. And if I look down below here under the Pixabay license, I can see what it is, what's permissible here under their guidelines. Free for commercial use, no attribution required. Wow. So basically this means I can just use this picture and I don't need even to credit the photographer. Okay. Now, um, what I'm, uh, what I'm doing here is I, I'm going to want to download the picture. So when I click on free download, it's going to offer me the option to download it in different sizes. And if you look at, at the sizes here, the, on the left, you see the size in terms of pixels. And on the right, you see the size in terms of kilobytes. So the left is actually what it's going to, how big or small it's going to be on the screen. And on the right, it's 
how much space it's going to take up to be stored on your computer. Well, I, the, so you want to choose the size for, for whatever your purpose is, right? And if I want to use this in a presentation, um, I'm going to want to be thinking about uh, the, the size of a, a PowerPoint slide, something like that. So I probably want an intermediate size. Uh, say the 1920 by 1277, because the, the if I chose this very large size, that would take up a lot of space. Look at that, 1.5 megabytes. If I chose the small one, you know, if I tried to blow it up, it would get pixelated. So I want a size that's going to be appropriate for me. So I'll download this, and uh, it it suggests a way in which I could actually. Um, uh, it, it suggests a, a possible way I could give attribution if I if I wanted to. Now, I don't think that you can see uh, my uh, file system here, but when I try to download this picture, it suggests a file name for me. It says, we're going to call this teacher-128966 underscore 1920.jpg. That is not helpful for me. So I'm going to change the file name to something I'll be able to remember. So I'll call it something like um, teacher at whiteboard, and then I'm going to put in who took the picture? So I'm going to put down teacher at whiteboard by, what was the name of that photographer? Jerry Kimball 10. And where did I get it from? From Pixabay. So I'm going to put all those things into the file name so that I will be able to find those things later on. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to do that for you for you now. Uh, what I had thought of doing was um, was looking together at how to take that then into a into a file editing program for such as um, a Photoshop or or something similar. But what I would do in that situation would be I I would take the picture uh, into Photoshop and I want to use it for uh, probably for PowerPoint. And so I depending on the um, aspect ratio of the PowerPoint I'm using. Is it going to be uh, the, the old style, which is kind of four across by three down, or is it going to be the new style, which is more 16 by nine? And then I'm going to want to, to convert it and to crop it according to, um, to a size that's going to be appropriate for my purpose. Um, so I would take it, I would open it in photo sharing editing software. I and the first thing I would do would be I would save it under a different file name. Why? Well, because if I if I take the the file that I downloaded and I manipulate it and I mess up, then I'm gonna have to go all the way back to the site to get that picture again, right? So I I want to I want to keep the original and I want to make a copy and that's the one I want to duplicate with. So that's the best habit you can learn is as soon as you open it, save it with a new file name. Um, I, I would crop it or resize it as I as I needed, and then I like to attach attribution directly into the image. You know, the the name of the photographer, the place where I got it, and that way I can move that picture around and not not worry about losing the attribution. And then you want to save it at uh, an appropriate uh, resolution. And when I say resolution, I mean, um, do you really need? to have the, the highest possible quality. Because remember, the high quality is going to be the bigger, uh, the bigger file size. Um, and these days, many of us work in places which are highly, resources, highly resourced, and we have fast computers and fast internet. And perhaps some of those issues are a little bit less important than they, uh, than they used to be. But a lot of people still live in places with limited bandwidth and slow internet. And you're really doing those people a favor if you can create images that are, um, are a little bit smaller. So what I would do would be I, I would uh, take the image into the um, file photo editing software, um, open it up, rename it, crop it, uh, add the attribution. And I usually do that with, um, with the text. And I try to make it somewhat unobtrusive. I don't really want the attribution to be distracting from the picture itself. Flatten the layers and then uh, save it uh, and so on. So that's kind of what I, what I like to do with, with pictures. And then, of course, there are a lot of fun things that you can do with pictures. Um, and someone earlier mentioned uh, conversation starters, uh, which is uh, a great way to to, to go, you can find some um, some interesting images and use those to start uh, conversations with your students. Um, you know what? 
happened here? What do you think was the cause of this uh, of this accident? Um, here's a uh, a famous image from the Library of Congress. Um, it's a, a photo of uh, is it? It's Dolly, I think. It's a, it's a picture of Dolly. And here's and this picture is interesting in part because I cropped it. So that here you can see the how they're putting the picture together, what things are standing on, and uh, and and so on. Uh, there are other kinds of pictures which are useful just to imagine, you know, the dialogue or what what uh, what people are are thinking. Um, here's one I think I used in my very first um, uh, virtual roundtable um, presentation in uh, in 2012. And here's one from um, from ELT. Uh, from ELT Picks, uh, taken by Sandy Millen, and you just have to wonder, who are these people? <laughs> Do they know each other? Are they related? Uh, you could get some really interesting conversations going. Well, uh, Pixabay was an example of a free stock photo site. Uh, and sometimes when we think about stock photos, we're thinking about those rather corporate kinds of pictures. You know, it's a bunch of very... Um, handsome or beautiful, well-dressed people. You know, here's a teacher, right? Oh, well, all teachers look like this, right? With, with the, the makeup and the desk and all those beautiful colors on their desks. I'm, I'm sure that this is what everybody looks like. Or, you know, here, here's the class and boy, is everybody looking happy. Um, and here are the students on the school bus. Uh, aren't they happy going, going off to school? Well, you can complain about the, those uh, photo, uh, sites in, in that kind of way. But as we just saw Pixabay, and here are some other examples of places where you can get uh, stock photos where you're just doing some, um, some attribution and uh, for the most part, and uh, you can get some pretty, good, uh, some pretty good pictures there. So uh, all of those are different spots where you can, can get some good, um, some good pictures. Let me, um, let me give you another activity. This is one where uh, you're looking at pictures of things and the, the photo is taken uh, pretty close to the object. Can you figure out what it is? I think this one is not too, is not too difficult. Um, what is this? What is this object would you say? Okay, Andrea, okay, guitar, guitar, guitar. All right, we have a good group. Frets, frets of a guitar, says Jeannie. All right, very good. Okay, how about this? What do you think? Something kind of grainy lines. Escalator says Jeannie and Marissa. You're right, it is an escalator. Here's a sort of larger, I, I actually zoomed in and cropped that, that picture to take, to take that. Okay, we've got the Hungarian version here, three escalators. All right, uh, here, this is a little bit, a little bit more of a challenge here, I think. Ah, Angelica's got it, and Helen. It's yeah. It's actually it's actually grains of salt taken very very closely uh, closely together. I'll bet sugar would look uh, would look different. Uh, here, I think you probably get this one. Oh, rock candy said mom. <laughs> looked like that. All right. Uh, yeah, rings uh, rings on a, a tree trunk. All right. Um, uh, something similar. Here's some some tree bark. Uh, I'm not even going to going to give you this one. I think that's pretty easy for people familiar with the U.S. It's the top of the Golden Gate Bridge. But this one, this picture is is stumps a lot of people. Um, it's quite it's quite a, cha a challenging picture. Uh, I will give you a hint. Uh, we are looking down at something from above. There's a zip, says Marissa. You might think so, but you would not be correct. It is not a zipper. Sorry. Nope. Uh, I'll give you a hint. The, the fuzzy kinds of stuff that you're seeing there, that is, a, that is a carpet. That is a carpet on the floor. And on the left and the right, Sharon. Sharon has got it. Sharon has got it. It is, in fact, a model railway train 
and there's a light on the train and the train has been going around and the, the camera was set so that the, the image, um, you know, it's, it's the light. So what you're seeing is the remains of the, the light of the train that has gone around the track. Well, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Okay, uh, quickly, just a, a couple more things to, um, to think about here. Um, one is uh, using memes, right? There are a lot of meme generating um, uh, sites out there so that you could uh, easily take a picture and then uh, turn it into, into a meme about using images in your, your teaching. Um, we can do a lot by putting uh, the camera into the hands of our students, right? And having students go out and take pictures of themselves or of others uh, in different activities. And you can give them, if you're face-to-face, -face, right? You can, um, you can send them on uh, sort of scavenger hunts. This is back in the pre-COVID era uh, when some students were out trying to do some, some different things. And that can be fun. Um, the New York Times put together a fabulous uh, series called This is 18, in which they gave a bunch of students around the world cameras with instructions uh, to go out and to take uh, and to take pictures. I am going to um, jump ahead a little bit. Uh, I wanted to touch on something that uh, Hannah talked about in her presentation uh, earlier today, and that had to do with um, the the challenge of pictures and fake news. And here's an example of a, a picture that is face fake news. Uh, it looks like waves are striking a, a pier, but in fact, that is not the case. In fact, uh, someone has combined two images, one of an ocean, the other of a pier here, to make it uh, appear that uh, there is something going on when it really isn't. So one of the things that we want to do for our students is some kind of sort of media literacy, right? We want to help them become aware that just because you see a picture uh, doesn't mean for sure that that's what it is. And, and as Hannah showed us, um, it's quite easy to doctor pictures in such a way uh, as to make them appear real. Uh, here's another fake picture purporting to be an airport underwater. It really wasn't. And this picture, um, is uh, this picture of supposedly a shark on a freeway has been pro be, been produced again and again and again, and it it just never really um, never really existed. So um, uh, just wrapping up here, I want to mention uh, a conference that takes place from time to time. Um, and and is this uh, is this maybe in Greece, Marissa? I'm not sure. It's called the, the Image Conference. Yeah, it was in Athens a, a few years a few years back. And also a free ebook called uh, The Image in uh, English Language Teaching, which has a number of very interesting articles on using images in language teaching. It's free. Uh, you can download that for free if uh, you look for the Image in English uh, Language Teaching. So. Um, our, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, there is the whole, uh, the whole link there. I wonder if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll put this in the chat later, later on. Um, so our goal today, we were trying to share some activities for classroom use, uh, to look at some good sources for obtaining free photos and to consider some basic techniques for uh, taking photos and making use of digital image files. I want to thank the many photographers who permitted their work to be used under a Creative Commons attribution license and uh, you can find the source of each picture credited directly on their slides. So thank you uh, very much. If you want to get in touch, um, I've got a website. It's www.joemcveigh.org. Uh, if you go there, there's a contact link if you want to send me an, an email. Uh, I'm not very active on Twitter, but I'm there. Uh, at uh, Joe McVeigh. And you can find um, a number of presentations that I've given on a um, on a, uh, a website called SlideShare. If you go to SlideShare and just put my name in, uh, that will give you uh, uh, quite a few uh, useful, useful things. So I wanted to give special thanks to uh, Heike and all of the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, take part. I hope it was useful. And uh, if anybody has any questions that you would like to ask, um, 
you can feel free to uh, put them put them in the chat or you can uh, contact me uh, later on. So um, thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Joe. It was brilliant to uh, knowing that uh, photos are very important parts, especially when working online. <laughs> and uh, to see where they are and how to use them. Uh, thank you uh, very much. And also for uh, informing us about Creative Commons. I think that's a very important thing. <laughs> uh, and especially with teachers <laughs> to explain where to get uh, uh, photos that are uh, being able to be used. There was one question. Uh, I, Chris uh, asked, clickable links or on video simply don't work. Isn't there a way to strip all the links from your PowerPoint, say, and copy them into the comments or description on the YouTube? Do you have a clue for that or does somebody have a clue for that? I, I would have to ask one of the YouTube mavens that, uh, about that, that there may be a way but I, I don't know what it is, sorry. Uh, thank you. Charles I says they have to be hyperlinked somehow, yeah. I mean, ideally you want the link to be clickable, right? Uh, if if you have the text of the link, you can at least copy it and, and enter it into a, a browser. That's um, it's a little bit cumbersome, but, but it, it works. Okay, so thank you very much and hope you will stay and and maybe you could uh answer the the one question or the other that will come into the chat and so thank you very much sure i'll and i'll find a way to share the slides uh as well so thanks great thank you